Hello, welcome to another edition of Thinking Like a Lawyer. It is holiday week. Obviously, it's Canada Day. No, actually, it's not just that it's Canada Day, but we have the Independence Day holiday coming up. And obviously, that means we're not recording an episode for this week, but we don't want to leave you empty handed. So for many of you, this is also the time when you start thinking about those on campus interviews that are rapidly approaching. And we thought this would be a good opportunity to revisit an episode from last year, where we we talked with an actual expert in career placement about how to approach on-campus interviewing. So if you will excuse probably some dated references in our grinding of gears moments, by all means, enjoy this archival episode about on-campus interviewing. And as always, thanks to our sponsor, Smith AI. <laughs> Welcome to Thinking Like a Lawyer, with your hosts, Ellie Mistal and Joe Patrice, talking about legal news and pop culture, all while thinking like a lawyer, here on Legal Talk Network. Hey, welcome to another edition of Thinking Like a Lawyer. I'm Joe Patrice from Above the Law, with me, Ellie Mistal. I'm so close to vacation. You are. You're going on vacation. That's exciting. Pretty much after we do this, I don't have to be here. Like, technically, Friday, but come on. So, yeah. So, this is my last, like, real thing. Yeah. No, I mean, that that's cool. What are you doing? I have two kids. I'm staying in my house and playing video games. I mean, with two kids, there are plenty of things that people go on vacation with children to, even. I live in the suburbs, so I will inflate some kind of plastic crap, put mm-hmm. water in it, and then watch them from my window while I'm playing video games. I see. Okay. So that's that's a fact. So I'm generally in a good mood, but before I take my hiatus, mm. I, I have found something that is really pissing me off today. Okay. If one more person tells me the ability to subpoena a president has never been tested... I'm going to wring that person's neck. Joe, as you know, on TV this weekend, because I do TV now, uh, (laughs) on TV this weekend, I was making this point. The reason why the president's, the ability to subpoena a president, the reason why that's never been tested is because no president has argued with the subpoena power. Oh, right. Yes. I was going to say it hasn't been tested, but I see right. what you mean. As in, it's never gotten to the point. Right. Because of a- every because think about what a subpoena is. It's simply an order to compel evidence, right? Compel documents, compel testimony. That's what a subpoena is. If you're the president of the United States, why do you need to be compelled to give assistance to law enforcement that you are arguably in charge of? Like, how can we live in this society where you, the president, think that you are so far above the law that you do not have to assist in law enforcement investigations? I know people are going to say, oh, well, most law enforcements aren't about the president. The president isn't the target of most law enforcement. Tell me, tell that to Bill Clinton. Right. right? Bill Clinton, Clinton v. Jones, he tried to avoid having to be sued at all. Right. That was not a law enforcement issue. That was not a law enforcement issue. It was a a private investigation. He was like, I don't want any bit of this. But once the court ruled in Clinton v. Jones that he was allowed to be sued, he testified. He didn't try to argue against the ability of the plaintiff to subpoena him. He did not. I mean, he did. He, uh, But ultimately, the discussion and the war of words and letters got to a point where they determined it was in the best interest not to challenge it and make a court precedent on it. But yeah, I so, mean, obviously, they tried not to. Clinton testified. Trump should testify if Mueller wants to talk to him. And look, I want to hear this crap about it being a perjury trap, all right? It's not a perjury trap. No, it is not. Your client's inability to tell the goddamn truth is not a perjury trap. Right. If Trump- that, is a tr- that is a term of art for our listeners, and no, being in a situation where you commit perjury does not make something a perjury trap. If Trump is worried that he will incriminate himself, Yes. And if I was Trump's lawyer, I would be worried about that because the man's a goddamn liar. But if Trump is worried that he will incriminate himself during testimony, there is a legal recourse. Mm. It is called the Fifth Amendment. Sure. So instead of – and here's the thing, people. Instead of elevating yourself 
and placing yourself above the law, if you simply place yourself subject to laws, the law will protect you. That's what it's there for. Right. I mean, that's that's any fairly Pollyannish, but sure. Any citizen has the right against self-incrimination. Sure. Donald Trump is no different. If he does not want to incriminate himself, he cannot be compelled to. All he has to say is, I take the fifth. You know, all he has to say. He doesn't have to have a Supreme Court battle royale over the subpoena power. Just Mueller, you know what? I take the fifth. What up? You know, that's and a, then we're done. You know, actually, the way you phrase that makes me wonder if that's true. Just because if you believe, and soon there will be a Supreme Court justice who does, that <laughs> presidents aren't amenable to being charged criminally with things. If he can't be charged criminally with something, he would not have a Fifth Amendment right. Right? Because, like, when we a common trick that prosecutors can do is grant full immunity to somebody and then they no longer have the ability not to answer a question because they have immunity so they have to they they don't have a fifth amendment right anymore so if well, it's because he doesn't need a fifth amendment right you, the fifth amendment was a right against self incrimination right he and wouldn't... once once they're immune they can't be incriminated and the question is if you believe, as Kavanaugh has articulated in his work, that presidents aren't amenable to criminal suit, period, then they actually can't incriminate themselves anyway. Yes, but they then they also can't ever be compelled to testify. Well, no, this would be that they – that's the whole separate question. The question of whether or not they can be forced to testify is one issue, which I'm sure Kavanaugh thinks they don't also. But if they are somebody who can get subpoenaed, you say the law gives them that Fifth Amendment right, and I'm saying, sure, I think it does and should, but if you're part of that group of people who thinks that you can't criminally try somebody, then I guess, theoretically, you shouldn't have a right against self-incrimination. I mean, you're trying to get into Kavanaugh's mind. I mean, Kavanaugh, right. and Kavanaugh thinks that the president has the right of prima nocta, all right? right. Like, he's... Sure. It's hard to tease out the logic of yeah. Kavanaugh's belief in the absolute power of our monarchy right now yes and obviously a lot of chips would have to fall into place and as you're pointing out i think correctly if it got to the kavanaugh front we wouldn't even have a subpoena but i i just am saying that there's like a fun wrinkle to that hypo that is if if he is compelled to testify and you believe that there's no chance that you can criminally try him then i don't know why a fifth amendment right would even exist but alas yeah so that was just kind of a weird hypothetical, the way you phrased it. It pisses me off that the president is not viewed as a citizen. Because if we can simply view him as a citizen, then the law already offers a citizen all of the protection they need to avoid self-incrimination. Sure. And that's that's fair. So, yeah, that was today's grinding of gears, I think. Um one thing I wanted to say, and I'm going to say this now, I will probably repeat it at the end, but it strikes me that maybe some people don't keep listening after we check out with our uh, with our guests. So I was just going to point out, everybody who's listening right now and subscribing should absolutely give us reviews, some stars, and write something nice about it and tell everybody to keep listening and to start listening because that helps. So I'm going to say that now because I usually say that as part of our ending credits and I... Just thought that it was worth throwing out there. I mean, if we're going to go down that route, yeah. um, you should read above the law. Right. <laughs> that's an excellent point. I, I, we've not really talked about that. We kind of assume people read above the law, but that's a good point. I met a guy today that was like, I love your podcast. Do you have a website? Amazing. And I was like, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Above the law, where you can learn all sorts so of things about the legal industry. Shirt. Yeah. So, speaking of things you can learn on Above the Law, one of the things you can learn on there is if you're a law student, you can learn how to advance your career in both fun and uh, more methodical ways, depending on the columnist. It's OCI season, bitches! Yes, OCI, which can is on campus interviewing different schools, call it different things, but it's when all of the firms show up and, like, chattel all of you in law school march in front of them and try to peddle your wares to them for the next summer this guy only ran a three six in con law but he ran a three eight in contracts yeah it's it's the combine for law students so we're very excited about that but first we'll take our break 
Are you missing calls? Are you spread too thin? Interruptions kill your productivity, but clients demand a quick response. The US-based professional receptionists at Smith AI help law firms screen new clients and schedule appointments by phone and website chat. Plus, Smith AI integrates with your software, including Clio and LawPay. Plans start at just $60 per month. Get a free trial at smith.ai. So we're back. So we thought we should have an episode now that OCI is about to begin, talking about on-campus interviewing, what it is, how to get through it, tips and tricks, uh, just kind of a a little overview of the process. And so we brought on a guest. It was a returning guest. We brought Nick Alexio on. He's the director of LLM and alumni advising and also the associate director of career services at Vanderbilt Law School. So welcome to the show again. Hey, everybody. I'm just trying to think what it's like to actually take a vacation with two kids, and it sounds worse than maybe anything else I can envision. (laughs) It's real bad. It's real bad. We went to Mexico back in the day with with both of them, and um, it was the worst. It was the worst trip of my life. It was the worst trip of my life. They, my children made Mexico not fun. I've I've traveled like semi cross country from Nashville to San Diego with my wife and two kids, and it is an adventure. It is something that you really can't prepare for until you actually do it. <laughs> yeah, it sounds easy to me. Anyway, <laughs> welcome to OCI. We're here at day three at OCI here at Vanderbilt, so we're already sort of got the Ooh. ball rolling. So you're in the, you've got the hotel room, you've got the students going through. Does Vanderbilt do it with a hotel room and a hotel block? We do not because we are fortunate even before the Me Too era. We have very nice interview rooms in our building that we can use. And so we have not yet had to go down the hotel route. We had done, we do regional job fairs for OCI starts because one of the themes that I've brought up in the columns I've been writing for Above the Law on career services is sort of how OCI keeps going earlier and earlier into the fall and even into the summer. And so we do regional job fairs in a couple of markets for OCI if it even starts. And we had done those in hotels in some of the markets in years past. And for not surprising reasons, we no longer do those in hotels. No, that's fair. Now, Ellie, you, you did this in a hotel block? I did this in a hotel block. Interesting. So at it, where I went, uh, we did it at NYU, we did it in the dorms. So the dorms were cleared out. And each firm basically had a little suite, and you went in to interview rooms off of that suite. It was very weird to, like, walk into a kitchen, and there's, like, a stack of Magnolia cupcakes, and then you just, like, go into someone's bedroom. And you might have actually been in that room, like, the previous year because you were hanging out. I interviewed with one firm in the room that uh, I had had. I didn't, not my bedroom, but my roommate's bedroom of the suite that had been mine the previous year. Yeah, it was normal. I think back, yeah. back, back until eight seconds ago. And it's also weird when they take out the bed and they leave the headboard up there and you're like, that's just strange. That's just not how it's supposed to look. <laughs> <laughs> to backfill a little bit, the first round of on-campus interviewing, OCI, involves basically speed dating with law firms. Not every school has this. Not every school is, quite frankly, lucky enough to have this. But the firms come to the school. They set up their partners in hotel rooms back in the day, now places on campus, just in a row of, you know, you know, scat in here, next is Cravath, next is Wachtell, next is DPW, so on and so forth. And then students come in and interview, you know, 15, 20 minute interview, kind of intake interview with the assigned partner for that firm. And then they go on to the next one. And it's based on those uh, 15 or 20 minutes that a firm makes a decision whether or not to invite you back for a longer, full callback interview at their offices where they really make decisions. Um, so it can be a stressful time. There are a lot of kind of tricks to the trade. One of my favorite OCI uh, questions is uh, actually a, a friend of mine on Facebook threw it up there. I'm going to leave you with this box of Legos. I'm going to give you five minutes. Please construct something that represents your love of law. That's I think the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I think that would be that, a great question. That 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 is terrible. And I, I, it, the first time that would happen, a student would come to my office and be like, "What just happened?" And I would shake my head and be like, "I I, I don't know what to tell you." <laughs> what's the best and what's the worst OCI question that your students have kind of reported to you, Nick? I mean, I would say the the best question and the one that I like to give a lot in when I do practice interviews with students here at Vanderbilt is, if I was to reach out to a previous employer of yours what's something that they would say that you can improve upon? And I think that question is great for two reasons. One, 
it's not just what you think of yourself, but what you perceive other people to think of you. So it makes you sort of think outside of your head for a minute. And second, because it makes you be a little bit introspective. I think oftentimes the answer can go sort of like in two ways. Some people try to say things like, I love too much, and that's a terrible answer. And then some people say, like, I'm a, I'm a fall down drunk, and that's also a terrible answer. But you sort of have to walk the line showing like you can be a little bit introspective, but not so much that you're giving away the game a little bit. So I think that's a great question because it makes people think sort of outside the box. It makes them think about themselves. The worst question, I've not heard a lot of terrible ones. I got one when I was going through EIW, as it's called at NYU, during a callback. Like I literally got the what sort of tree would you be if you could be a tree question. And I was super excited years later that that firm went out of business. Um. My answer on the worst question ever is a story that happened to a colleague of mine from law school, which was partner said, says here on your resume, you went to Yale for undergrad, but you didn't go to Yale Law School. I went to Yale Law School. Why didn't you go to Yale Law School? And my 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 friend's response was, I don't know. Why don't you work at Cravath? That, <laughs> that ended that, that one, but that was the worst question I've heard. That's great. My worst question wasn't at OCI. It was at uh, callbacks. Um, and a partner at a firm that I still will not name said, can you mail this for me? Yeah. <laughs> wow. I thought I was a mailroom guy. Yeah. So I didn't go to that firm. I think the worst answer I ever gave, because it was actually a perfectly fair question, because I had gone to law school in New York, and I was interviewing in D.C., and the, it was a great interview. It was with the, like, the partner in charge of the Summer Associate Hiring Committee. And his last question was, all right, so where do you see yourself in five years, New York or D.C.? Because he knew that I was interviewing in both markets. And the obvious, I mean, it's the easiest layup answer of all time. You just say New York. Even if that's not the right answer, just move on with your day. And for some reason, I just heard the words New York come out of my mouth, and I was like, oh, God. And he just looked at me, and he was like, is that a Freudian slip? And I was just like, uh, yes. And I did not get a call back, or I did not get an offer. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a key one that we should localize and isolate for our listeners. So... If you happen to be going to law school in New York, you probably are working in the major market, and that's cool. But whether you're in those schools and looking to go elsewhere, or you're at a school like, say, Vanderbilt, not everybody from Vanderbilt's trying to work in Nashville. Indeed, quite a few of them aren't. So how do you deal with the questions of where are you interviewing and when it's in multiple markets? How do you really sell somebody that that's the market you want to be in? I think there's two ways to approach it. I think it depends on the market. I think if you're talking about big markets, your New Yorks, your Chicago's, your DCs, those markets are large enough that they recognize that people want to come there from all over the country. And so if you're looking to go to DC, you know, you can sell yourself on the fact that, you know, I want to go to Covington and Burling because you guys have a fantastic world renowned litigation practice. And that's why I want to be there. I want to go to Williams and Connolly because I want to do appellate litigation, things like that. You don't need to sort of prove some sort of personal connection, but that's sometimes the case with smaller markets. So if you're looking to go to Denver or Seattle or Phoenix, places like that, you can still try to sort of highlight the industries that are in that particular area. And maybe there's a particular industry in I Phoenix, like for instance, that you're really interested in. But sometimes that personal connection can be best. Yeah. Yeah. They, the personal connection is the only way. I mean, I didn't, I interviewed almost exclusively in New York. And to the extent I didn't, I interviewed in places that I had lived before so I could claim a personal connection. But I know that's not a common experience and people do have that. So I thought it was worth going into. And I think one thing you want to avoid also is like, you, I'd much rather someone go to Denver and say, I want to be in Denver because of this sort of market than my wife's aunt's third cousin's brother lives in Denver because no one cares. <laughs> Nick, how do you deal, uh, how do you advise students to deal with, you know, stink bombs on their transcripts? At some schools, the employers don't get a chance to see this transcript before they interview the students. At other schools, they do. You're in the interview. The person that you're, the, the partner brings up, you know, the B that you got in contracts or, you know, the B minus that you got in torts or the C that you got that means that you're never going to get the job. And if, if I, I want to jump in real quick here, because this is a key point for our pre-law listeners, which I know are out there. This process is by and large handled after your first year. So you are talking about grades in those first year classes. So don't think you have time to improve on your grades throughout your whatever you do, but that's to get in the back door. This process is based on your first year grades generally. Right, and as so. long as we're talking about that, it's yeah. also worth pointing out that your first year classes are, this is why your first year classes are the only ones that matter. 
Yeah. But you'll learn that uh, soon enough. Um, so anyway, yeah, Nick, how do you deal with if you're a student who got a particularly bad grade in one of these core classes um, their first year and it comes up in the interview? Yeah, and I think even it's not just first year. I think as more and more firms are shifting to hiring 1L, it's about your first semester grade. So that even becomes, there's even less of a chance to sort of prove yourself. But in terms of bad grades, I think it depends sort of what that class is in and what you want to do long term. So like if you know you want to litigate and you got like a B minus in contracts, I mean, you could try to spin it that, you know, I got a B minus in contracts, but I really want to be a litigator and I got, you know, an A in civil procedure or I got an A in criminal law or I got an A in something that shows that I can be a pretty good litigator and maybe I'm not going to be a transactional attorney, but let's focus on the classes that I did well in that are in line with what I want to do. If it's not something like that, if you don't necessarily know what you want to do yet, or if it's you know a grade that's in something that you want to do, again, try to pivot just sort of in generally saying, you know, that was maybe something that I, something happened in this class, or I thought I answered a particular question correctly, but I didn't, and sort of ended up, you know, getting this grade. But let's look at all the other classes that I did well in. One thing you don't want to do in the situation is you don't want to, like, throw your professor under the bus. You don't want to say, you know, I got a B- minus in contracts, but professor so-and-so is terrible, and, you know, no one can do well in that class. Because, A, Oftentimes, people that you're interviewing with went to that law school, and they might either have had that professor and done well, or know that professor socially, and it will, they'll get back to them, sort of saying, "Oh, you know that you know Bobby Joe over here like threw you under the bus," and that's something that's not going to be good for you long term. And then if it's maybe <laughs> one bad grade or two bad grades, if they happen, if you're doing OCI right for your second year and you've got a couple bad grades from first semester, but you really turned it on the spring semester, then you can sort of spin a narrative about how, you know, you were trying to figure out how to study for law school, or you're really trying to get adjusted to a new city and a new surroundings, and it took you a semester to get your feet under you. But now, you know, look at what I did in the spring semester. That's a much better indication of what I am as an attorney, what my abilities will be, and I'm confident that my grades will continue to increase as I go throughout the rest of my law school career. I was talking to a, a student that I met through above the law, um, and he was he, he had some bad grades and he was kind of Facebooking me about, you know, ways to get around it. And one of his suggestions was that he wanted to go into OCI and explain to the partners um, that, well, you know, he's not a game day player. Not yet. He needs some practice on that. But, you know, he's a really good practice player. It's just, you know, game day. He, he tightens up a little bit. Practice. And I'm like, practice. You want, you, you, you Talking want, about practice. You want to tell a big law partner that you freeze up under pressure. That that's. That's your strategy, man? There's not a lot of opportunity in the big law world to redshirt or to spend a couple of years sort of, you know, getting your feet wet. And, you know, if you go to the big, big places, you are going to spend a couple of years probably doing more, you know, less glamorous tasks. But they want you to do those less glamorous tasks at an A-plus level. And so if you're telling someone, yeah, it's going to take me a little bit of time to sort of get, you know, situated and get my feet underneath, check back to me when I was like a third-year associate. I think I'll be ready to go. You're not going to get an offer. Yeah. I look, the other thing is, look, people have to also understand people have to have some self-awareness with this. Um, and that kind of gets into the bidding process. But in the schools that are lucky enough to have multiple employers coming to campus, not everybody gets to interview with every firm. Right. You have to pick you have to bid on which firms you're going to try to interview with. And so one of the things about if you've got a stink bomb on your transcript, you have to be aware of that. Right. You have to be aware of that and maybe like not waste your bid on cravat. Yeah. <laughs> Number one, if you're rolling in there with a with a C in CivPro, um, may, maybe cravat doesn't need to be on your bid list. Maybe you aim a little bit more. I'm not going to say lower. I'll say realistically. Yeah, and it's it's you know it's about making sure that your GPA sort of aligns. Even if you're at a school that doesn't do GPA, if you know that there's something on your transcript or even there's something in your personality, like if you are a more introverted person or a quiet person and you want to bid on the top you know litigation boutiques in a particular city they're looking for standout personalities they're looking for people who can command a room instantaneously even if you have the best grades in the world if you can't command a room they're not going to want to bring you in for a callback let alone hire you because they need people who can both do the work but can also sort of thrive in the environment that they practice in day in and day out which brings me to my uh, kind of indirectly to my next question nick Given the moment, you've already mentioned how Me Too has, has changed even the structure of on-campus interviewing. What do you do with your personal politics in this moment? There are a lot of people who are in law school, who went to law school specifically to 
kind of fight the good fight. And then they realize that money buys things. And they find themselves kind of interviewing for these corporate jobs. How should they handle it? Conversely, um, there are people in law school who are Trumpy. Does that come up? If you're Trumpy, do you want that to come up? Do you want to avoid that at all costs? Like, do you, where do you put your MAGA hat on your way to OCI? Well, it's what's the great Leo McGarity line from West Wing. You discovered at some point that you can buy things with money. And right. I think in terms of your, your, your MAGA hat or your Bernie pin, I think those are things that are best left at home for your OCI interviews and even for your callbacks. I think that for these big firms, you know, we've mentioned sell out. <laughs> that, that's fair. Uh, but you, you both have jobs, and I have a job, and we're trying to get everyone else here jobs as well. Um, and so for the purpose of getting a job, now once you have a job and once you've been at that firm for a while, if you want to adorn your office with every sort of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez paraphernalia you can get your hands on, by all means do so. We have to actually get that job initially. But in terms of you know the big firms, you know, we talked about the Crevasse and the Wachtels and the Davis Polks and places like that. These are all massive organizations that have clients on both sides of the aisle, and they know that they will have to put you in front of clients that maybe run a little bit more liberal or run a little bit more conservative. And if you can't hide your, not hide, but if you can't not bring your politics out over the course of an interview, a 20-minute interview, what confidence can they have in you for not doing that over the course of a meeting that might have millions of dollars on the line? And so that's something that you really don't want to bring up if you can avoid it. Now, if you go into a callback, and I wrote this in, in one of the, I think in the article I wrote for Above the Law, the four-part OCI series I did, I think part three was on callbacks. And I said, you know, if you walk into an attorney's office for a callback interview and their office is adorned with Trump stuff and you are very much not a Trump voter, you know, hopefully it won't come up. But if it does, try to pivot the conversation back to, you know, the subject hand, back to your interview. You know, if someone says like, you know, what do you think about Trump? Be like, oh, you know, he's the president. And then you sort of talk about something else. I think it's something that you don't necessarily want to bring up. The exception to that is if you're actually applying for a job at a nonprofit. And we have some of these who come to OCI every year. And then if you're supplying to them more broadly, if you're applying to a place like Southern Poverty Law Center, then you can bring up your politics. I mean, then it's something that they're going to want to see from you. They're going to see your legal ability as well, but they also want to know that you're sort of a line of what they're looking for politically. So that's one time that you can bring it up. The other thing to keep in mind also is if you do feel that passion about your beliefs, if you feel like you are selling out by hiding them, you know, recognize that might limit some of your options. Because I'll tell some students that they want to have, you know, as broad array of opportunities as they can. Like I joined the American Constitution Society my third day of law school, and I would not have left it off my resume because I wouldn't want to have worked at a place that would look down upon that. But if you want to have the broadest array of options you know, available to you, have on what you do at law school, but have the things that are maybe a little bit more nonpartisan on your resume and sort of maybe leave off that you're president of the Federal Society or president of ACS and things like that. If you want to work, if you want to broaden your horizons, if you want to work at a place that you feel comfortable, leave all that stuff on, but realize that your opportunities are going to be a little bit diminished. Yeah. I mean, I think that picking up on that, my thing is always do your research beforehand. People act like one firm is as good as another, is the same as this other one, and just the same, except for that one's in D.C. And that's really not true. And while it can sometimes be difficult to find out this information, especially if you don't read above the law all the time, the information is still out there. I would not work for Jones Day. <laughs> and there are lots of reasons for that, but all of them I can find online. Right? All of the reasons why a person with my politics would not want to, and I'm not saying that there aren't liberals at Jones Day or whatever, but all of the reasons that a person with my politics would not want to work at a firm like Jones Day are obvious if you do a little bit of research into Jones Day. Conversely, look at where I did work, right? A person with my politics can fit in pretty easily at a place like Debevoy's, and all of the information for that is available online as well. And also, if you're going to the DC market as well, you know, one thing to keep in mind is you know, be aware that sort of the D.C. firms are almost countercyclical to the politics of the time. And so, you know, if you are at the big firms in D.C. in the Obama administration, a, a lot of the more liberal attorneys are out in the Obama administration. And so when things switched over to Trump, a lot of those attorneys came back. And so there might be a lot of D.C. firms that themselves are a little bit more liberal now because all the conservative attorneys are practicing in the administration. And then if, if things switch in 2020, that's probably going to reverse itself. That's a great point about D.C. specifically. Um, the counter-cyclical nature of it. And it's also, again, when I say do your research, also research like what practice area you kind of think you want to go into. Because there are practice areas where it just it doesn't matter a damn what your politics are. 
You know, the only politics that a lot of practice areas care about is green. So if you're really focused on doing certain kinds of work, then it really ain't going to matter what your politics are. Other kinds of work, you might want to put in the extra work to find a place where you think you're going to be comfortable. That applies to diversity as well, wouldn't you say, Nick? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think if you are a student of color and you want to go to a place that is supportive of students of color or attorneys of color, that's research that you should definitely do. And it's not only, I mean, definitely read above the law all day, every day, especially the stuff that Ellie writes and stuff that Joe writes and stuff that I write. But I think you also can talk to your classmates. You know, if you are a member of, you know, the Black Law Students Association and you know of your upperclassmen, second years and third years, or even third years if you are rising 2L, who have gone to these firms, ask them what it's like to be a, an attorney of color at these firms. And then once you get past the callback stage and you get an offer, you can go for what's called second looks, which is uh, what, you know, you already have an offer in hand, so you have a little bit more freedom to sort of ask to meet with certain people or ask to ask certain questions that you were afraid to ask while you're still waiting to get an offer. And so if you have an offer from a particular firm and you're not sure how they're going to deal with matters of diversity, ask to go back for a second look and to meet with you know, attorneys of color or ask them about their diversity policies and get that information before you make your decision. And that information, you know, the stuff that's on about the law and on the internet is great, but the, decision, the stuff and information you actually get from the attorney's who are there and the people who are actually there might be a little bit better just as to what's going on at that moment at the firm. All right. So um, I want us all to answer the quintessential, the prototypical OCI question. Nick Alexu, why do you want to work at this firm? You know, I think I want to work at your firm because what I see myself doing for the next five to 10 years is to do be in a particular practice area, be a litigator with your firm. I've always wanted to do appellate litigation, and I feel that you know your firm in Washington, D.C. is one of the standout appellate litigation practices in the nation. I feel that my background with you know a graduate degree and my you know a standout grades in these various classes, and what I'm even taking this you know this coming semester, show that I have a real knack for this sort of work. I hope to do a clerkship after I graduate, and I think this puts me on a path to being a valued member of your uh, appellate litigation team, but even not appellate litigation, I understand that's difficult practice area to break into with your firm. I think the overall culture of firm XYZ meshes well with what I can bring to the table, and I think I could be a valued asset to your team. Joe, why do you want to work at this firm? That's a weird question because, yeah, I'm not in voice, I'm just saying, I, that's a weird question because it is so fact-specific in my mind. And I think Nick Gamely created a series of facts for you. But for people trying to answer this question, you can't have the same answer for every firm. You should not even try to. The reasons why I wanted to work at the firm I ultimately ended up choosing involved me saying a lot of stuff like, I am a fan of the work that you do in litigation, yada, yada. But also, it had a particularly small litigation department at the time. So I said, I'm actually looking for a big law experience, but with a department that is more of a small law within a big law feel. Uh, the ability to have more close relationships with senior associates and partners than you would at a firm that is much larger department where it's more regimented. Like These are the sorts of things that I said in that instance. But I also applied, because I was also interested, in a firm for completely different reasons. When I was applying to a firm that did a lot of labor litigation that I found interesting, I talked a lot about how I not only was interested in the fields that they were in, but I was quite frankly not necessarily interested in becoming a long-term partner, but in the clients that they had and that I was interested in learning more about that business from the inside of a firm and maybe going, going out like that, which firms you would think they wouldn't like to hear, I'm thinking of leaving before I join. But uh, when you say I'm thinking of leaving to become a client, they're super happy. So that was how I did that one. So it was different in each case. So I can't really give a prototypical answer, but those are the sorts of things I looked at and thought about when I was answering, which would be type of work, but also type of environment. And you can find write-ups out there, and you also talking to people, explain things about the environment. Like, I knew that Cleary at the time had a small, not only had, but advertised around that they had a small litigation practice that was more responsibility because of its size at the time. 
I did have more of a standard answer, I think, than either you, Joe, or you, Nick, partially because, as I think this podcast has shown in a couple of different instances, I'm not a great liar. I'm not a great actor. Um, my emotions kind of in real time show on my face. Yeah, your, your work on law review in college showed you were not a good actor. <laughs> and so I really did workshop my answer kind of in, first in front of a mirror, then with some friends. And my standard answer would always start with a truth. I'm not sure that I do want to work here, sir. Mm. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's also good, right? Because you're kind of, oh, I'm opening myself up now. Bold move. So your approach to this was the negging the yeah, firm. exactly. <laughs> okay. You, um, you came in dressed in something peacocky, you <laughs> negging. You rolled all in with the singles game. Nice. I'm a Harvard graduate. You want me. Right. You're like the mystery of OCI. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would start off with, I'm not sure if I do want to work here. I'm interested in the law. And then I would do a little bit of what both you and, and Nick did of like, I'm interested in the practice that's important at this firm um, law, but I'm also interested in politics. And then my kind of finishing move was basically I, all the firms I, I interviewed with, I had at that point a pretty good knowledge of all of their people who were USAOs in the Southern District or the Eastern District of New York. And so I would say, I'm not sure. I do like this area of law. However, I'm also interested in politics. And when I look at Lauren, and Chris just start naming people, right? And I see how the uh, the work that they're doing in the Southern District, and I see the cases they're you know they're getting in the in the Eastern District. I'm like, this firm is the one to train me to do that. Well, that's super specific. Yeah, that's yeah. that's useful. If you have like, even if you have a bunch of interviews, that level of research I think is, is definitely commendable. Because I mean, and especially in this sort of modern legal economy. Like when I went through OCI back in 2006, wow, I'm old. I think towards the end, I was just like grabbing brochures as I walked in the door and being like, so you're from <laughs> Maine Tech. Okay, let's talk about that. But I think if you can dedicate that sort of time to learn the names of certain attorneys at the firms and what they do, I think that will go a long way in proving to the attorneys that you're interviewing with that you're really committed or really interested in that firm. On that note, the, one of the best questions I personally was asked during OCI is the attorney interviewing me from Morgan Lewis closed the interview with just, and while we're here, spell Bacchius, which is the third name in that firm. And I was like, I don't, he's like, no, nobody does. It's fine. <laughs> but yeah, they, that was very much their test on how much research I had done into the minutia. And I did not know how to spell Bacchius. I do now. Devavoy's. I think it's still Devavoy's did a site redesign recently, so I'm not sure if it's still there. But it was definitely there for over, well over a decade. You had to nest a little bit, but there was a link, an audio link, to pronouncing the firm's name right because they were so sick of people walking Walking in in not knowing Plimpton. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and that's actually a good point. And one thing I tell my students here at Vanderbilt is, if you're unsure on pronunciation, that's something you're going to need to know. Every firm probably has like clips on YouTube or things that you can find online. If you don't have to pronounce firm's name, go on YouTube, just type it in and just listen to someone say it. Listen to someone say it 10 times until you've got it down cold. Because the worst thing you can do is, is walk in and say, I like to work at Debevoir. And they're like, please leave. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks for joining us and giving us this update on OCI. Also, you mentioned it as we were going, but it's worth noting that on Above the Law, the website that, by the way, this whole thing started with Ellie saying some people listen to the podcast and don't know there's a website. I think we have mentioned it between the three of us 15 times. But yes, on the website, Nick writes a column and he has a primer of OCI stuff. So you should also be reading that as kind of deeper supplement to what we're doing. Thanks for joining us, Nick. Also, thank everybody else for listening. Uh, Repeating the call from earlier in the episode, you should be subscribing to this and you should be rating it and giving it stars and writing reviews and telling people, passers-by on the street, that they should be listening and subscribing because we have shows that are fun and informative occasionally like this one. So do that. Also read Above the Law. Also follow Ellie at Ellie NYC at Joseph Patrice on Twitter and listen to other Legal Talk Network shows. There are a bunch of them on the platform. So check those out. And that's it. Talk PlayStation, to here I come. Yes, Ellie will be going to do PlayStation. And so next week, we'll, well, we'll figure out what we'll do. Might be a different compliment next week. All right. Talk to everybody later. 
If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. You can also find us at AboveTheLaw.com, ATLRedline.com, iTunes, RSS, Twitter, and Facebook. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.